We are very happy to have our last speaker. He's our keynote speaker for today, uh, Dushyant Kosla. And uh, he is an uh, enterprise data scientist uh, currently working in Philip Morris International. And not many people know, but this is one of the biggest employees of data scientists in our region. And uh, Dushyant, uh, he really impressed me with his uh, like CV when you are checking it. So first of all, he uh, started his Bachelor of Engineering in Birla Institute of Technology and Science in Pilani. This is one of the top uh, uh, quality technological university in India, and only one in 70 candidates uh, get to position in this university. He was one of the 70 people. Uh, they have a, they're very restrictive selections. After this, he worked in several companies. Actually, uh, first, like he worked for four years in one company, Absolute Data Analytics. And then he decided to move to Ghent uh, for master in uh, marketing analytics uh, to work a little bit more on his education. Then he came back to India, uh, worked again in companies, went back to Ghent and landed in Lausanne finally to work as a data scientist, a full data scientist working on setting up a data science framework uh, with his exp um, experience. And from my friends, I heard this is one of the best environments what he is building basically when you are coming to the company and people really feel friendly and happy working with us using open source software. So more and thank you. Thank you so much, Pavel. Hi, guys. How's everyone doing today? I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, before we begin, a quick disclaimer. Uh, this talk will not have any code, any math, or any robots in it. So just wanted to make that clear before we begin. So my talk is about enterprise-ready machine learning. Uh, it's a high-level look at what works and what doesn't work when you try to implement machine learning models for the enterprise. Uh, it is also based a lot on my own personal experiences working in uh, the data science industry for the past uh, eight years or so. So a lot of my struggles will be uh, discussed, and I hope that some of you will find it useful or at least cautionary in your own work. Uh, I will begin with uh, talking a little bit about me. I know uh, Pavel covered most of it, but uh, I have worked in, uh, in startups as the first data scientist. I have worked in big organizations like Walmart as uh, one data scientist of many. And now uh, at uh, Philip Morris, I am a senior data scientist uh, working with a team of uh, uh, between five to ten people. Uh, Education-wise, Pavel covered, I have an MSc in Marketing Analysis and a Bachelor's in Engineering. Uh, as a data scientist, I consider myself to be a generalist data scientist, which means that I have skills in a diverse set of areas. So I do uh, visualization, I do machine learning, and I also do deployments. Uh, I am a type B data scientist, where B stands for builder. There's another type A, which is like an academic data scientist, more uh, focused on research or algorithm development. But uh, a, a type B would be more focused on building uh, tools with uh, machine learning cores. So a quick show of hands before we move on. I would like to know how many of you are data scientists or use data science in your work every day? Excellent. Uh, how many of you would like to be data scientists? So anybody training to become one? You guys will have fun today. And uh, are there any, anyone here who is looking to hire data scientists? Anybody who's going to? Perfect. You're in the right place. OK. So uh, building data products uh, or data intensive applications, these things are all the rage right now. VCs are pouring a lot of money into companies that are using uh, user data, behavioral data, and building products around them. So we will go over some of the things that you need when you try to build a product around user data. Uh, the first thing we will cover is uh, how do you formally define a data product? So a data product is just, uh, in my opinion, is just a software product with a machine learning core. So you could have a web application where users sign in and do something. But if there is an ML engine in the middle, I would call it a data product. So formally defined, it is a system that takes raw data as input, applies a machine learned model to it, and then produces some data as output. That data could be a prediction, a, a regression output, or it could be a label as a classification output, or it could be a segmentation output that helps doing recommendations. Uh, 
additionally, and this is where data products share a lot of their properties with software uh, in general, is that they must be dynamic and maintainable, and they should allow periodic updates. So anybody who uses apps on their phone or on their computer know that software is released periodically. You have a new version of YouTube's app, or you have a new version of the Skype app coming uh, periodically. So data products are no different. They would evolve over time. Uh, good examples of CRM mod uh, of uh, data products are CRM models. So uh, these are almost everywhere. There's uh, companies that try to figure out which of their uh, visitors are going to become uh, converted users. They try to figure out which of their existing uh, clients are not going to renew their contracts. So uh, data products are everywhere in, in industry. They're everywhere. I really like this, uh, this quote as it sums up, in a way, what the best case scenario of a data scientist's work is. Uh, yes, you could produce a report, and yes, you could produce a dashboard, but if a data scientist's data product produces sort of an API score that can be integrated into an existing system and then powers downstream applications, that would probably have the potential to fundamentally change the operation of a business and where most value could be extracted from a data product. So how do you build these data products? Uh, there's a really cheeky uh, acronym, uh, pronounced awesome, uh, to describe the work that we data scientists do. Uh, where So you, you go through these steps, obtain, scrub, explore, model, and industrialize. Uh, on the right, you see this graphic that sort of summarizes this process. There's the real world that you collect some data from. You uh, process this data, you clean it up, you tr uh, transform it into meaningful features that help you capture the signal from the data that you have uh, gathered. Uh, some of it goes into an exploratory data analysis uh, branch. Some of it informs the machine learning algorithms that you're going to build. The important thing to notice, this is a common visual, I'm sure you must have seen it before. The important thing to notice is that this is a cyclic process. So you see at the end there's the dotted line, which brings you back to the beginning. So the product that is built from user data is going to influence user behavior. So over time, the model's parameters are going to change because your model, if successful or if it fails, is going to affect user uh, metrics in some way. So if I'll, I'll come back to YouTube as an example. If they introduce a new feature tomorrow in their app, then user activity might increase or decrease. So learning from this, the next version would probably drop that feature or improve that feature. Or some of its uh, coefficients might change. So now that we have an awesome process in place, we talk about what kind of things that you would need in order to make that process work. So uh, Monica Rogati, she's a data scientist earlier at Jawbone. Uh, she came up with this data science hierarchy of needs. It's a really nice way of summarizing the basic things that you need to be able to do data science in enterprise. Of course, at the bottom layer, you have data itself. So unless you have instrumentation in place, unless you have uh, signal catching capabilities in place to collect this data, to store it somewhere and to have ETL pipelines running that convert uh, these raw data into, uh, into scrubbed features that can be aggregated and then can be used for machine learning. Uh, AI or deep learning is just a, a far goal. Unless you have the bottom layers figured out properly, you have uh, ETL scripts running on schedule, and you have good labels, and you have good metrics, and you know that the kind of data that you're receiving at probably in the middle analytics level is okay. Unless you know that your number, you're counting the number of users on your app correctly, there's no point doing AI. First, you need to be confident that yes, the basic metrics are being tracked properly. So this kind of serves as a checklist for you before you go out and try to do AI. The real value is only going to be available to your business once you are confident that you're catching the right things. Another quote that sort of summarizes this, uh, this sentiment, it says that a data scientist's capability 
to convert data into value is largely correlated with the stage of a company's data infrastructure and how mature the data warehouse is. So this happens quite frequently. There are startups that will hire their first data scientist. There are companies that will invest in a whole data science department. And then six months or a year down the line, they will realize that it's not providing the kind of value or the revenue that they thought it would. The reason is simple. The data science is a garbage in, garbage out process. If your data to begin with was not good, was not clean, then there is no way that a data the smartest data scientist would not be able to give value. So the first thing to do is to focus on the bottom layers of the pyramid. So unless the foundation is rock solid, it would be nearly impossible for any kind of team to deliver uh, any real value with their data products. So let's assume that you have uh, the data. Let's assume that you have the awesome process in place. Now what you would need are pipelines. A well-engineered pipeline would allow your data scientists to run different kinds of experiments. So at the end of the day, data science is just an implementation of the scientific method. You hold something uh, constant, and you change something, and then you try to measure what the impact is. It's just uh, test and control. You want to see uh, what the effect of a treatment is when you hold some things constant. So when you have a robust pipeline in place, then you're free to run these experiments. You can try to change your input data. You can try to change your regularization parameters. You can try to engineer some new features, or you can combine existing features in new ways. Uh, sometimes it, it helps to add two features together or to cross them uh, and create new features that way. So unless there is a solid pipeline in place, running these kind of experiments sort of leaves you with, with no idea of what's happening. Uh, pipelines also are easy to reproduce. So this brings me to a really nice rule of machine learning. So Google has published this around list of 50 rules that they uh, encourage their developers to follow. Rule number four says that you keep the first model simple and get the infrastructure right. It sort of tries to tell you that infrastructure is more important than the model. So while it is fun to think about all the imaginative ML that you're going to do, it would be hard to figure out what's happening if you don't trust your pipeline. So exactly, if you're trying to apply the scientific method, if, if you're in a laboratory and you want to figure out what happens if you change the independent variable, uh, what kind of impact does it have on the dependent variable, you need to keep all other variables fixed. The next section, we will discuss why if, if you have this plan, if you have this blueprint, if I do this, this, and this, if I have my data in place, if I have my pipelines in place, I should be able to, uh, to extract value out of my data. Why do still most machine learning models never made, make it into production? There are a few patterns observed in the industry, and we will go over the, the three most important ones. Today, this morning, I was just browsing my phone. On, on Instagram, I saw this ad. It says, become a data science master in a month. I've been doing data science for eight years, and I'm nowhere near being a master of data science. This is what is wrong. The education of data science is kind of broken right now. Claims like these make people believe that this is something that they can get into today, and six months down the line, they can have that sexy data science job with a six-figure salary. I know it's, it's really... Uh, uh, interesting, or it's really, uh, you, can't, you can't blame them. The media is marketing it as a sexy, high-paying job, so, job, so people really want to, uh, to get in. There's high demand. The online courses and the university degrees, sadly, they focus on the top tiers. They will teach you how to use Pandas and Spark, and they will teach you how to probably uh, query some databases. But writing pipelines or helping you understand what scheduling is or what the inf how you build the bottom layers, is something that is missing. So this is something that I have noticed in my experience is uh, data scientists that are self-taught or that are fresh out of university make this one error. They, they come into their first day of work expecting that they will receive a CSV file with clean features. They expect that from day one they will be able to work on cool machine learning algorithms. But this is so far from the truth, it's almost funny. Uh, because the first few months, obviously, they're just going to be doing ETL. They're only going to be working on the bottom few layers. So predictably, it leads to frustration and a mild case of quitting and going for another job. 
that happens a lot. People in their first six months tend to get bored of this because they just come in with, with different kind of expectations. So this is something, it's, it's sort of like a, a wake-up call, I think, that data scientists need to, uh, to acknowledge today, is that building machine learning models is becoming easier every year. I remember that eight years ago, if I wanted to build a random forest model, I would have to write 30 or 40 lines of code. It was difficult. But over time, the APIs are evolving so quickly that it's becoming almost a no-brainer to build a machine learning model. Building that model is not... Uh, the task these days. Auto ML is just around the corner. So that famous definition that uh, a, a data scientist is just a statistician uh, who knows more, pro sorry, as, is, a, is someone who knows more programming than a statistician. So that does not hold. I think in, in two or three years, that is going to be irrelevant. A data scientist in a few years is going to be the person who knows how to how the system works, who knows what, the, what role their data product plays in the larger scheme of things. So it's only a small part of the bigger uh, product. So how does, uh, how does your machine learning algorithm provide value to the rest of the components of the system? Those are, the important, those are going to be the important things in the next few years. So what would be the essential skills then for data scientists, people who are aspiring to become data scientists or those who are looking to hire data scientists, what, sh what should you be looking for? Uh, I, I read through a few blog posts, I looked at a few interviews of data science thought leaders, and everybody, there's, there's like a common theme. All, they all say that data scientists don't know how to collaborate. And, and I'm not surprised, because when you look at data science curriculum, they, they don't mention version control, they don't mention uh, Python virtual ends or how to use Docker containers. These courses will teach you how to write 15 different machine learning algorithms, but not the system that will consume them. So surprisingly, so if, if you had to guess, what is the most often cited skill that data scientists lack? What would you say? It's, it's version control. It's such a basic thing. If you hired a software engineer, you would take it for granted. You would know that this guy knows version control, that's his daily bread. He knows how to, uh, to write tests, he knows how to package his code, he knows how to refactor his code, he definitely follows style guides. These are the kind of things you would take for granted, you would assume that if I hire a software developer, he knows this. With data scientists, especially because of the high demand and because anyone, anyone can be a data scientist in a month, these skills are missing. Uh, data science interview processes also focus on algorithms and not what matters. So some level of proficiency sooner or later will be necessary and these data scientists will have to build those. The next challenge is about culture. Now this is at the company level, this is at the enterprise level. Uh, now companies tend to organize their data science departments into groups. So you have this group of data scientists, they are going to build the cool models. Then there is a group of data engineers who are going to take those models and put them into production. And then there is a group of DevOps that are going to provide the platform that all of this work happens on. Now because of this uh, fragmentation, what happens is that there is a tendency of these people to go into their own silos and start doing their own thing. Data engineers want better latency. They want better performance. They focus on things like scale. They concern themselves with scale. Uh, data, data scientists in their group, they want to impress each other with a fancy algorithm. So even though this is a company that should work in one direction, there are people that have different research interests now. So it sort of leads to a conflict where you see uh, data scientists building like a, a machine learning model inside a Jupyter notebook and handing it over to a data engineer who would laugh and say, okay, this cannot be sent into production. It's a notebook, there's no version control, there's no, there's no history. Uh, you hear things like, uh, it works on my machine, so it should work on your cluster. So things like these sh sort of show you how much of a gap there is between what expectations people have uh, Josh Willis is the guy who came up with that saying in the first place, the uh, better programmer than a statistician, and he also came up with this cheeky infinite loop of sadness. 
he says that, uh, so you have business guys that try to uh, make unreasonable demands on data scientists that, okay, answer me this question, why are my sales falling? An unreasonable question because there is no straight answer. So now the data scientist will go back to the data engineer and say, I need these five pipelines running. The data engineers would say, okay, I am overwhelmed by this, give me more compute power. So the ops guy would then go back to the business and say, okay, now I need more money to get more infra. So this turns into like a vicious cycle where no work gets done and everybody is frustrated with each other. It's a big culture conflict that needs to be resolved and I think a simple empathy towards what other people do and how they consume your work should fix it. Uh, Josh Willis again says this, and I think it's a, it's a beautiful sentiment. He says that data scientists won't get to inhabit the world that they want to live in until they work with the data engineers and DevOps to create it. It's a nice way of putting it, that if you really want uh, to be in a world where your model can be deployed from a Jupyter notebook, then you will have to create that world with the people who, work, who you work with. It's kind of a philosophical note, but it really resonates. The third challenge is misdirected focus. And this is something that Google has published at least twice in the last two years. So on the right, you see this, uh, this, uh, this flow chart or, the, or, the, or this, uh, it's a system diagram. And in, in the middle, that little black box is what ML code is in that system. So it's a system, it's a, it's a data product. And that little black box is all the ML pipeline that there is. You have that training pipeline in yellow, you have the deployment pipeline in blue, and that is all that the product of the data science effort is. So it is important for people to acknowledge and admit that the product of their data science effort is a really small part of really large software, and yet all of their time is invested in it. If your data product development runs for three months and you spend three months on perfecting this model, then it's, it's, it's really inconsequential. Data products must be designed to integrate well with systems up and downstream. And data scientists need to acknowledge that systems can work without models, but models are useless without systems. Kind of try to put things in perspective. Google, again, has a really nice rule about this. Google says, don't be afraid to launch a product without machine learning. I mean, it's a little controversial. Google is saying launch a product, but don't have any machine learning in it. But what they're trying to say is that get the infrastructure right first. They're trying to say that let there be a heuristic in there as a placeholder. Once you get the pipeline and the infrastructure right, then add complexity with a machine learning model. So try simple things first, get your infrastructure right, and then start doing the, the fancy stuff. OK, so now we know how data products are built, why they're important, what challenges there might be in building of data products. Now I would like to bring you to how we have overcome some of these problems at Philip Morris. So we've been spending a lot of time discussing these issues. Uh, what kind of things will help us uh, move faster towards production, what kind of things will help us uh, create products in a rep reproducible manner. So first I will talk you through some numbers uh, on, on our team. So we, have, we are part of Philip Morris's uh, Enterprise Analytics and Data Group. Uh, we call ourselves EAD. We have about 40 data scientists across four hubs uh, across the planet. So we have offices in Lausanne, uh, in Amsterdam, Krakow, and Tokyo. Uh, the profiles of these uh, data scientists, about 30% hold PhDs, uh, about 70% have a master's degree, 7.4 years on average is their work experience, but they're very young. As a team, we're very young in Philip Morris. It's only two years average experience within the company. People have expertise in machine learning, uh, in big data engineering, in insights communication, and all of these 40 people are Scrum certified. So we used agile methodologies for development of our data products, and all of these 40 people are uh, Scrum certified developers. Some principles that we try to follow as an enterprise, so these, are, these guide our actions. The first, the most important one, is that we protect sensitive data. So we, are G GD we ensure GDPR compliance, we guard 
confidential information by ensuring that data never leaves the platform. So we do all our work on remote machines. We SSH into those machines and data is never taken out. So we ensure that data, sensitive data is protected. Uh, all data is always reported in aggregate. There is uh, anonym, anonymization techniques in place. So data is always protected. Uh, we avoid restricted open source libraries. It's uh, just to respect the IP rights of authors of those libraries and to protect ourselves against uh, lawsuits. Uh, Google also has this uh, uh, policy in place. They do not allow their developers to use AGPL licensed software, for example. Uh, and the last of our principles is to always say, stay industrialization ready. So we uh, always stay ready to deploy, monitor, and improve our models and we try to reduce the time to market. So unless there is a one-time POC that would end in just a report, we try to be industrialization ready, that we, we want to have uh, uh, as little time to market as possible. We believe that data science is software and should be treated as such. Uh, artifacts that are produced by data scientists, like model predictions or interactive visuals, are part of a software release cycle. We define three stages of software development, uh, alpha, beta, and general availability. In alpha, we, we are in exploration mode. We will try to see what works and what doesn't work, what kind of models can we use here, what kind of data is going to be useful. Uh, we look at basic visualizations. We look at statistical distributions of our data. In the beta, uh, we try to uh, solidify things, we try to build the MVP, we try to see how it would work, we, we automate certain things. Uh, at the, towards the end of the beta, we try to define some SLAs uh, to make estimates for industrialization. So then the, the pink circle in the middle, that denotes the decision for industrialization. So at the end of beta, if, if the beta proves to have value, we decide whether to industrialize it or not. And then the general availability phase is where we have full automation and end-to-end -end monitoring, and the model is in deployment. So all of these stages are time boxed. It's not like we stay in one stage forever. If uh, we, we would time box an alpha to two months of exploration and time box a beta to eight months of development and so on. Our vision was to create a platform that was flexible so that would adapt to the needs of the different kinds of use cases that we have that would accommodate changing requirements. Sometimes we have medium sized data, sometimes we have massive data, sometimes we need GPUs, sometimes we don't. So we wanted our platform to be uh, flexible that way. We wanted it to be inspectable. Also, one of our guiding principles is to always be able to provide an inventory of all the things that we are using to build our software. So complete transparency uh, so that artifacts can be audited at any time. Uh, reproducibility, so we wanted to have out-of-the-box dependency management and no more saying that it works on my machine. So if uh, if you build something, it should be reproducible enough that it can work on any other machine as it does on yours. And then it should be easy to use. So people come from different backgrounds. They have different, uh, they're used to different development experiences. So we try to give them as close uh, to their known development experience. And we give them the freedom to experiment. So uh, our experienced data scientists and our experienced data engineers got together and started building these kind of Lego blocks that now data scientists assemble to create their own data products. So I will take you through the tech stack itself. Uh, we have a few different components. Uh, let's start with the easy ones. So at the bottom, you have Amazon Web Services. That's our infrastructure uh, provider, so all our uh, the, our cluster, our uh, virtual machines are all hosted on Amazon Web Services. Uh, Hadoop is our storage layer. We have uh, data stores like Hive, which, is, which are built on top for, for warehousing. We have our code repositories hosted on Bitbucket. Uh, in the middle, you see the DS Prod Lab. It, that's the data science production lab, which is like our workbench. Uh, think of it as a virtual machine with Docker installed in it. So. Uh, all of our development work is done within Docker containers that are uh, running on these machines. So these uh, Docker containers are created by us. We have an automated pipeline for creating these uh, fine-tuned uh, Docker containers that have only the components that we need for a particular 
uh, use case. So if we want to do a deep learning project, we have a Docker container for it. If we want to do a small data project, then we have a Docker container for it. Uh, so a, a data scientist just SSHs into his machine, uh, downloads the right Docker image, downloads his code from, from Bitbucket. And all this while, so all our Docker containers, they live in a repository on Artifactory. All our uh, Python packages or other packages, Java, they all live on Artifactory. And Artifactory can be scanned by the service called Black Duck. So we uh, are able to provide the ability to scan everything that we use uh, through uh, Black Duck. We also have Jenkins uh, pipelines for build automations. So our uh, so one of our deployment pipelines uh, for uh, web services and APIs and our uh, uh, Docker containers pipelines are, ru are running on Jenkins right now. And then we use Flask to expose the model either as an API or as a web app. Uh, so this is the technology stack that we work with. It is uh, constantly evolving. We keep uh, assessing new technologies um, uh, to bring onto the platform. So the, this, uh, through the Docker containers running on these DS prod labs, we also give our uh, data scientists the ability to use the cluster. So if they are working with data set of massive size, they can uh, launch Spark jobs on the cluster from within the, uh, the same DS lab. The last thing that I would talk about are Scrum teams. So in order to overcome that problem that I mentioned earlier about uh, the, the culture problem, so we created these cross-functional teams. We, we create like teams of five people, five individuals that come together to solve a business case. We have a data scientist, a data engineer, a DevOps guy, a scrum master, and a business owner on one team trying to solve one problem. So it's not like you go to the data science team and say, OK, this is a problem. Now figure out how to solve it. And then they go to data engineer and say, OK, I need somebody to solve this problem. No, we put together a team that uses the Agile methodology, works as a whole, they are responsible for the end-to-end -end delivery of the product, and they are working together for a common goal. It's not like you're from DevOps and I'm from data science anymore. It's we are a team, and we have to deliver this product by the end of the year. So it helps to kind of diffuse the culture problem. It's, uh, it's a work in progress, and I hope that uh, one day we will have a, a clear answer on, on the culture problem. Uh, I will quickly take you through a few of the best practices that help our data science, uh, data science teams to deliver rapidly and reproducibly. The, the title of the talk is Reproducible. So the next two technologies that I will talk about help us ensure that we do some really robust reproducible science. So we use containers and virtual ends extensively. Uh, Docker containers help us wrap both system level dependencies. So if I have some GCC libraries or some Fortran libraries that I need to run my code, uh, I wrap them up into a Docker container. If I have any Python dependencies, I wrap them into either a Conda env or a virtual env. And I make sure that all of my dependencies are available wherever my code needs to run. So my code is sort of guaranteed to run everywhere when I use both containers and virtual envs. Uh, I will let you read through. These are the benefits of using uh, Docker containers and Conda environments. So if, if you guys were not aware, I'm sure Docker is, is commonly used here as well. But uh, one of the things that I like uh, is that there is ease of reinstallation. So whenever I want to start a new project, I spend no time setting up. I just pull the Docker image that I need, and I spin up a container, and I, off I go. I really like the fact that there is isolation with, with the environments where uh, nothing that I install will mess up my system Python or my Python 2 will not mess up my Python 3. So I like that about, uh, about environments. And then uh, we also have uh, Docker containers that are optimized for deep learning or for time series analysis. So it takes a lot of uh, pain out of the setting up process. The second thing that really helps us do reproducible science is the use of templates. Now this idea, is borrowed from web development. So if, uh, if a guy wants to build a new Rails app, all he would do is go to the CLI and say something like Rails new. And then he would be taken through uh, a series of questions that will set up the base repository of his project. Uh, so on your right, you can see a visual where the different directories, where, where we store what, is all clear. So whenever a new person joins the team, they would instinctively know where to find data, or where to find models, or where to find code. 
Uh, the code folder, for example, is organized in a way that it is easy to turn into a package. So if tomorrow I want to, I'm, I'm close to finishing my beta, I can, take this, uh, I can take this repository, I can take the source folder, turn it into a Python package, publish it back on Artifactory, and then it is available for everybody else to use. Uh, the, using this template also helps us enforce two important philosophies. So we have um, raw data is immutable. We do not change raw data by hand. Any data that is stored in raw will never be modified by hand. And the second philosophy is reproducibility. So the code that goes into this repo should be such that anybody should can pick up the data in raw, the code in source, and the dependencies in Dockerfile, and completely reproduce your analysis. So with these three things in place, if I go and I pick up my project from six months ago, or if I pick up uh, the project of my colleague, I will be able to reproduce their analysis. We put a lot of effort and emphasis on uh, converting notebooks to scripts. Now, this is a common uh, design pattern that we observe. Data scientists love notebooks. Uh, notebooks are everywhere, but we make sure that we communicate that this is only for exploratory code and for technical reports in some cases. Uh, notebooks are really nice as an exploratory tool, but when it comes to version control, they're really hard to manage. Uh, there are no re code refactoring tools, and uh, you can't even run them directly. So what we try to follow is something like the, the visual on the bottom. We try to keep reducing the amount of code in the exploratory analysis uh, notebooks and try to keep moving them into the production code base, which are Python scripts. So slowly across sprints, you see that the production code grows and uh, exploratory code goes down. We also try to implement some coding standards. So now these things are important because now data scientists, some of them who come in, are not aware of uh, PEP8, for example, or tools like PyLint that help them clean up their code, or uh, they know how to write good doc strings or understand type hints. So we sort of create uh, an induction package where we bring them up to speed on all these things. So at the end of it, we want them to write code that is re readable so that somebody else picks it up is able to read it. It is reusable, so whatever code you write is modular and can be reused in other projects. It is tested so that I can verify that it does what it advertises, and so I can confidently integrate it into my pipelines, and that it is reproducible. So only packages that are approved, so those open source uh, licenses that are approved and are available on production environments should be used. Another thing that we have uh, created for helping data scientists move rapidly through alpha to beta is easy deployments. So if the data scientist has written code in a, uh, and wrapped up the dependencies in a Docker container, the Python virtual environment works fine, then all they have to do is <clears throat> publish that Docker image to Artifactory, uh, create a small configuration file that Jenkins uh, will pick up automatically and will run that deployment and uh, make an endpoint available on, on our internal network, uh, which will be available to a select directory of users. So it's, it's sort of like push button deployment. Once you create a Docker container that can run your app, then scaling up and deployment is not really the data scientist's concern. We also uh, allow them to scale up with Spark, so we, we try to maintain a, a, a balance of the right tool for the right job. So if your data is under 10 gigabytes, use Pandas. If it's under 50 gigabytes, try to get more RAM or use an on-disk DB like Postgres or SQLite. If it's more than 100 gigabytes, then try to use Apache Spark on the cluster. So for doing this, we've made it easy for them to issue Spark jobs via Spark submit scripts. So they, there is a Docker container that has a connection to the cluster, and all the data scientists would have to do is submit their PySpark code via Spark Submit, and uh, all load balancing issues will be taken care of automatically. Lastly, uh, we promote continuous learning. So all data scientists in our teams are encouraged to progress along their career path we provide them learning opportunities, uh, like they, they get to attend two conferences a year, 
Uh, they have subscriptions like Safari where they, get, they have access to all the books that are published, all the tutorials that come out. Uh, they, ha they are encouraged to, to, to take uh, online courses uh, which are, are paid if they, uh, if they uh, qualify. And then we have some in-house trainings that, that take place over the year. Oh, just on time, okay. Which brings me <laughs> to the last slide. So in conclusion, and we can have questions after. Uh, so I would like to leave you with this one thought, that industrial data science is a team effort. Uh, if you're trying to build smart systems with uh, uh, ML at its core, it's a very difficult thing to do, and it requires a team of people to work together. In making good data products, most problems will boil down to engineering tasks. Machine learning is, again, a small part of the product. Software engineering skills are critical for data scientists. So all of you here who aspire to become good data scientists, the difference between good and great data scientists is software engineering skills. A lot of people know how to build machine learning models, but very few people know how to really put them to use. So an, a, a model sitting on a shelf is not useful. Uh, make sure that your pipeline is solid end to end before trying ml so if you have a solid pipeline then you're doing proper ml because then you're applying the scientific method and then uh, <clears throat> last is to start with a reasonable metric start with simple models and then add complexity incrementally with that i will close and open the floor for questions thank you very much and um, we have 10 minutes uh, for questions. Just remember, we have Aperon. Here. So microphone is for recording, so you have to be loud. Thank you very much for the whole presentation. A couple of questions you answered along the talk, like for example, do you actually version uh, Jupyter Notebooks? And I guess yes. So you had the one thing mentioning that 30% is PhDs and the rest are masters. So do you find PhDs useful? Would you rather prefer masters than PhDs? Would you recommend an aspiring data scientist to do a PhD? Uh, okay, so I would say it depends on the kind of problem that we are trying to solve. There are some problems for which uh, the PhD's expertise is essential, and, then there are, and sometimes we have simple problems for which you don't really need a PhD. So I would not mix these two things up. Dep so you need both. You need both kinds of people. You need people with deep expertise, and you also need people with uh, like a generalist, I would say. So a, a PhD in my book is a, is, a deep, is a person with deep specialty on a topic, and uh, a person with a master's can have a diverse uh, set of skills. So both are important in my book. So that's why we have a mix of them. Cool. Maybe I, I noticed something um, before my question. Uh, something what uh, may not be clear for everyone here, it's uh, because some of the people are really working in science. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain a little bit about Scrum? How does it organize? What is a Scrum Master and so on? Okay, so Scrum is a way to sort of organize your project where you take a big problem, you break it down into smaller pieces, and then you attack those pieces one by one. So you you decide at the beginning of, we call these sprints, two week intervals with, within which we try to accomplish something. So at the beginning of these two weeks, you would decide what I want to, so you set goals for yourself. At the end of those two weeks, you would uh, present the work that you have created. So the unit of work that has been created, you present it to <clears throat> the business owner and sort of get their feedback. So it's, it's a system where you build products incrementally with constant feedback uh, uh, on what is being built. So that uh, it's, it's, oppo it's opposite to the waterfall scheme where you, you get requirements and then six months later you come back with something built. Scrum is, uh, as, as, is an iterative process with constant updates. Do you have a sprint for two weeks or six weeks? We have two week sprints. But I mean, uh, it doesn't have to be fixed. Yes. So I have, I have two questions. The, um, the first one is about the cost of your infrastructure. So how far back do you keep these uh, archive and how much does it cost you to maintain that? And the second one is do you version the data also? 
and uh, how do you Great synchronize question. that with the code? So uh, the cost is flexible because since we are on AWS infrastructure, we have the freedom to move some things into cold storage. So uh, if I don't want something, if, if I don't foresee having to use a piece of data for the next three or four months, I can always move it into long-term storage and not pay as much for it. So uh, I can't put a fixed number on the cost that we incur in terms of data storage. But yes, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is in my hands to control it. Uh, your second question about data versioning, we have been talking about it, uh, but then we always come back to the same argument. If my code is versioned, and if I never change the original data, then my data is also versioned. So if, if data is immutable and code is versioned, then I'm not really, uh, I can reproduce that piece of data that is linked to a piece of code. So yes, sometimes we do version it. So for example, if I, if I have data coming in from different APIs, I fill up a database with it, and I do some feature engineering, then I take a snapshot of that DB. So in that way, I would know that version one of my model used this DB. And then maybe next month, I would have a new dump of data, then I would also version that again. That's uh, not something that we do as a standard practice, that is project to project basis. But mostly we just follow that data, raw data is immutable, so whatever came from the source was never modified, so the code can be used to reproduce it. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was really interesting. So my, my question was also related to uh, data versioning. And then maybe a follow-up question is, uh, do you have uh, like a feature store? Because I guess you, you may have very complex features that you calculate. Do you, do, how do you document that? How can you really share across projects what you have done and what you have learned from the data you have in-house? So this is something that we're in the process of building. Uh, the projects that we work on are very different from each other. So there would be one team working on a manufacturing project where we are working on machine data. Another team would be working on device data. And there's a team that is working on consumer level analyses. And there's a team that is working on website optimization. So we don't really have a feature store because there's very little overlap between these different projects. But uh, over time, we would like to have a feature store with clear ownership over every feature. So a feature store is really useful if you have a web store like Amazon. There it helps because you use the same features for different applications. But here we have too many different applications and features don't overlap. So for us it did not make sense right now, but yes, we would definitely uh, work towards building one in the future. <clears throat> Thanks uh, again for a very interesting talk. Uh, I think this is uh, topics that really need to be discussed and especially presented to students and PhDs because uh, in effect that they often come to interviews saying I built this fantastic model but uh, then the reality of the day-to-day -day job is rather different. As, uh, as a actually a team leader, often the difficulty is giving good estimates on uh, s product development stages. You showed that you go from stage alpha to stage beta to general availability. And you said these are time boxed a priori. But often, maybe a you have a product that is very kind of important for the company, and uh, you still want to develop it, but you don't know beforehand how long it's gonna take. So how do you manage this uh, uncertainty, which is kind of goes quite in contrast with uh, also agile development, because yes, you make these chunks of time in two weeks, but you have a rough idea that a development job should take three months and you bring it down to two sp to, to sprints of two weeks. But in data science, often you have much more uncertainty. I agree. So with, within enterprise, there is an added level of complexity to that un uncertainty is if I say three months and then I say I want two more months, then I need funding for those two months, right? So uh, so far in my experience, it has been that if, uh, if I planned for a three-month time box and it's spilling over, then I would uh, negotiate with the, the project owner and try to get funding for the project if it's an important one. If not, then it might be killed. 
So uh, I have, I've had both scenarios where a, a, a funding was pulled from the project or the project was deemed uh, necessary for more funding to be given to it. So both things could happen. But before killing the project, you wait to the end or? Sorry? Before killing the project, you wait to the end of this period when it's funded or are you starting to be worried before? No, but if, if you realize that this is n not going to be industrialized, then you would kill it there. So maybe a last question and we move to. Yes, uh, just one question, and perhaps you already answered it, but uh, I apologize if that's the case. Um, what type of, uh, what team size do you personally work on, and what type of other profiles are needed within the team uh, to be successful at your undertakings? So, uh, like I said, we have uh, teams of five. So, uh, for, for each uh, hub, uh, like in Amsterdam and Tokyo, we have teams of five people. Uh, scrum teams of five people, so the data science teams have one team lead and four data scientists. And scrum teams will pick up one data scientist, one data engineer, and form together. So I know a lot of other enterprises do the same. Uh, they make cross-functional teams. Uh, in the Netherlands, I know that Booking.com does this, where uh, you have a product owner. So the, it's a software product that they're building. And maybe they want to introduce a new feature onto their platform. So there would be a product owner for that feature. And then he would get a data scientist, a data engineer, uh, depending on the volume of the problem, of course. But yes, it would be, again, a multidisciplinary team. And I think right now, today, with, with what we have learned so far, data science is, again, a new field uh, from 10 years of development. What we've learned so far is that a, a, multidisciplinary, uh, a multidisciplinary team has the, the best chances of delivering on a project like that. Uh, the, uh, the other option is to hire a unicorn who can do everything, but those are difficult to find. Yeah, so there, there are no, so uh, it's really cool, but I think that like in software development, you saw the rise of the full stack developer. You have guys that can do front end and you have guys that can do back end and then you have guys that can do both. I think data science also will see the rise of a full stack data scientist sort of a profile that are good at a few things. So uh, I know that there are a lot of data scientists who are very good at building models, but then you will also see some that are very good at visualization and deployments and pipelining. So I think over the next few years, we will see roles like that. And then maybe these te teams can grow smaller because you would have uh, guys that can do multiple things. So I propose to uh, move forward to eat the food. We also thank you again to Philip Morris for providing us the uh, apero. Thank you guys. And we are inviting you all for uh, next year for more meetups. Thank you very much.